Volume Two, Chapter Four of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume Two, Chapter Four. The following morning. Cathcart was early at the house of Mr. Thorold, and Celestina, who rose now earlier than usual, to enjoy, if it could be called enjoyment, a few hours before she was compelled to hide her sorrows under the appearance of attention to the family she was with, met him as he came from the stable, and instead of going into the house, she desired he would walk with her towards the village. "'You have news for me?' said she but if i may guess by your countenance none that will relieve the weight i feel on my heart i am afraid not replied he yet indeed i have nothing to say that should increase it mr willoughby is well he writes to me with more cheerfulness than i expected and assures me that he has a long letter for you which he shall send from dover where he shall finish it from dover he is then set out on this expedition ah cathcart and ought not such intelligence to add to my concern not at all replied cathcart you knew before that it was his intention and he tells me that on the event of this journey depends his ever seeing alveston again there is certainly a chance of its terminating favourably at all events if this absence is to end your suspense, you should not only submit to it, but endeavour, my dear Mr. Mornay, to keep up both your health and spirits. Alas, Cathcart, answered Celestina, there is nothing so easy to the happy as to give such advice, nothing so difficult to the wretched as to take it. She then inquired into the other particulars contained in Willoughby's letter, and after informing herself of the day when he expected to be at Dover, and how long it might probably be before she should receive the letter he promised her, she turned the conversation on Jessie, whom she expressed an eager wish to see, and soon after Montague Thorold, who impatiently watched her wherever she went, came to tell her that his mother waited breakfast for her. Cathcart, however, declined the invitation to breakfast with them, and wishing Celestina a good morning, and promising to be with her again in a day or two, he went in search of Mr. Thorold, with whom he said he had some business. Many succeeding days passed without any interesting event. The captain took every occasion to impress on Celestina an idea of his consequence, and the fashionable style he lived in, to which she gave very little attention, while his brother, whenever he left him an opportunity, talked to her of books, or read to her passages in favourite authors of which he heard her express approbation. She was prevailed upon to sing duets with Arabella, and he was enchanted with her voice and manner. She sat down to draw the flowers he gathered for her, while he hung over her in raptures or held her palette, or read a botanical description of the plants she was painting. Captain Thorold rode out occasionally to visit such of the neighbouring families as he considered worth his attention. Arabella was often of his party, and Mrs. Thorold engaged in domestic concerns. And then, if Celestina could not escape to her own room before Montague, who was always upon the watch for her, could interrupt her, he entreated her so earnestly to walk with him, was so obligingly solicitous to please her, and seemed so mortified when she attempted to excuse herself, that she could seldom resolve to refuse him her conversation, even when she was most willing to be alone. And in the similarity of their tastes and studies, and in the brotherly though silent sympathy he appeared to feel for her sorrows, there was something soothing to her sick heart, which rejected every idea of love but for Willoughby, conscious of which, 
and supposing that no man could consider her otherwise than as destined to be his wife or to die unmarried she dreamed not that she was granting to young thorold indulgence fatal to his repose he was himself soon aware of the danger but he courted it and though he understood that the heart of celestina was engaged he fancied that without any pretensions to her love he should be happier in being admitted to her friendship than the unrivalled affections of any other woman could make him he was too artless and too proud of his judgment to attempt to conceal this attachment from his father who had celestina been disengaged would have preferred her with her small fortune and uncertain birth to the richest heiress in the county but knowing how she was circumstanced he saw his younger son's increasing partiality with some concern and took an opportunity when they were alone to tell him the real circumstances of celestina in regard to willoughby i can consider her said he no other than his affianced wife they are parted by some cause of which i am ignorant but which will probably be removed in the meantime her youth and beauty render her situation very dangerous as from her being a foreigner an orphan and probably the natural daughter of some person of high fashion in france who has taken care to destroy all evidence of her real family she is without relations and without protection willoughby's father was my old friend when i was an indigent curate he gave me a living which though i have now from being possessed of greater preferment resigned i consider as my first step towards affluence i am therefore bound to the family by gratitude and to young willoughby i am bound by personal friendship and esteem except something too much bordering on rashness in his temper i hardly know any man so faultless and so worthy of regard he adores miss de mornay and i am convinced the happiness of his life depends on their union finding him torn from her for the present at the very moment this union was to take place i entered at once into all the uneasiness that must have assailed him and i voluntarily offered my protection to her which he has since acknowledged in a letter to me to be the greatest kindness he could receive i have promised him to continue it as long as she has occasion for it or will accept it do not therefore montague by any of your eccentricities make this uneasy either to her or to me don't fancy yourself in love with a young woman who is in fact married any other kind of attention or regard you show her will oblige me but let us have no making love unless you would drive her away and greatly disoblige me the young man readily promised what at the moment he was sincere in that he would not make love to celestina but he did not promise not to feel the passion against it was too late already to guard him mr thorold however supposed that after this explanation there was nothing to fear from the extreme susceptibility of his younger son and for the eldest he was too certain that he had not a heart on which the charms and virtues of celestina or of any other beautiful and interesting woman could make any permanent impression he was easy therefore in a situation which would have made many narrow-minded and selfish parents very much otherwise and did not think the presence of his two sons at home a sufficient reason for withdrawing his generous kindness from celestina to whom he was indeed affectionately attached for her own sake to whom he loved to consider himself as a guardian and protector mrs thorold always busied about the intrigues and schemes of the rest of the world saw not very minutely into those of her own family as to her eldest son she contemplated him as a superior being who had a right to marry the greatest heiress of the kingdom she heard him speak so often of lady mary's and lady caroline's that she concluded 
he might have any of them whenever he pleased and had set her imagination so high as to his merits and his fortune that she never supposed he could think of bringing her any other than a titled daughter-in-law celestina whom she looked upon as a creature whose title to respect was very questionable a dependent from her birth and now little better than a dependent on herself was not a person likely to make any impression on captain thorold and the prejudice operated on her person and her manners mrs thorold could not see that she was handsome or feel that she was interesting and when the attention of young thorold was very strongly marked towards her his mother only ridiculed him telling him he was never easy but when playing the philander and that he cared not with whom nothing therefore interrupted the progress of that serious passion which montague thorold determined to indulge and of which celestina was perfectly unconscious the more unreserved slattery and free address of the captain she knew how to repress and received all his advances with so much coldness that his pride was piqued and unused to the slightest repulse he determined not to brook it from one who had in his private opinion very little right to assume dignity or affect disdain the manner he took up towards her in consequence of these opinions was so very disagreeable to her that it forced her more than ever into the society of his brother before whom though the captain held him very cheap as a boy and a pedant he could not well address to her such speeches as he had ventured to utter several times when he seized an opportunity of speaking to her alone or unheard by the rest of the family whenever therefore she was compelled to be below she contrived to have montague thorold sit next to her to accept his arm as they walked and to address her discourse to him and flattered by this evident preference he let no occasion pass of proving how happy it made him so passed heavily for celestina the days that intervened between that when she last saw cathcart and that on which she expected willoughby's letter from dover the day arrived at length and celestina who happened to be sitting with arabella and her brothers when the letters were brought could hardly support herself while the captain took them from the servant and reading the direction of each threw them across the table now one to his sister now one to his brother and bade montague carry a third to his father there was none for celestina though cathcart had told her it would be directed to her at the house of mr thorold of this bitter disappointment however she spoke not but tried to conceal the change it occasioned in her countenance and hastened as soon as she could to weep alone over the sad idea that willoughby's diminished perhaps annihilated love had allowed him to torture her with suspense which he might so easily have avoided by punctuality another almost sleepless night was the consequence of this delay but though without rest in the night celestina rose as soon as day appeared at no other time but early in the morning she had now any chance of being alone either in the garden or the neighbouring fields and the air seemed necessary to her overburthened spirits in the fields she seemed to breathe more freely and her heart which often felt as if it would burst was relieved while she was allowed to weep unmarked and uninterrupted a narrow road shaded by thick rows of branching elms led towards the village which was that way almost a mile from the house of mr thorold who did not inhabit the parsonage but an house he had built on a farm of his own celestina to avoid being seen from the windows of the house which commanded the garden and the meadows near it took her way down this lane her thoughts ran over the strange events of the preceding years 
in which she had experienced so much anguish anguish embittered by the transient promise of supreme happiness as she reviewed her whole life it seemed to have been productive only of regret why cried she was i ever born alas my existence was the occasion of misery to those who gave it me why did dearest mrs willoughby take me from a confinement where i was dead to the world and where perhaps neglect and hardship might long since have released me what will now become of me if willoughby forgets me how shall i find courage to drag about a wretched being useful to nobody for whom nobody is interested and which seems marked by heaven for calamity these melancholy reflections led her on till a turn out of the road brought her to the stile of the churchyard she leaned pensively over it and read the rustic inscriptions on the tombstones one was that of a young woman of nineteen it was her own age and celestina felt an emotion of envy towards the village girl whose early death the rural poet lamented in the inscription merciful heaven cried she is early death ever really to be lamented and should i not be happier to die now than to live as perhaps i shall to be forgotten insensibly this idea took possession of her fancy and with her pencil she wrote the following lines in her pocket-book not without some recollection of edward's thirty-seventh and forty-fourth sonnets sonnet o thou who sleepest where hazel bands entwine the vernal grass with paler violets dressed i would sweet maid thy humble bed were mine and mine thy calm and enviable rest for never more by human ills oppressed shall thy soft spirit fruitlessly repine thou canst not now thy fondest hope resign even in the hour that should have made thee blest light lies the turf upon thy virgin breast and lingering here to love and sorrow true the youth who once thy simple heart possessed shall mingle tears with april's early dew while still for him shall faithful memory save thy form and virtues from the silent grave celestina who had a natural turn to poetry had very rarely indulged it but since she had passed so many hours with willoughby his passionate fondness for it and his desire that she should not neglect the talent she had received from nature had turned her thoughts to its cultivation and now almost the first use she made of it was to lament that she lived since none of her acquirements were to please him for whom alone she wished to possess either life or talents she had finished her sonnet and read it over aloud she changed a word or two again read it and was putting it into her pocket-book when she was startled by the sight of montague thorold who appeared behind her though she had not heard him approach do not he cried be offended dearest miss de mornay if i thus break in upon your solitude and do not continued he taking her hand in which she still held the pocket-book do not punish me by putting away what i have so earnest a desire to hear celestina half angry replied i have nothing sir worth your hearing i have offended you said he in the most respectful tone i see you are offended if you knew my heart you would know how much better i could bear any misfortune than your contempt and anger celestina whose slight displeasure was already at an end answered with a smile that he certainly deserved neither but come continued she you were sent i dare say to call me to breakfast and we are loitering here i was not sent answered he 
I believe it is yet earlier than you imagine it to be. You are not then offended at my interrupting you? Oh, no, think of it no more, said Celestina, wishing to change the discourse. Is it not a delicious morning? He answered not her question, but fixing his eyes on hers, said, See how soon a second trespass is attempted when the first is so graciously forgiven. May I ask, as the most inestimable favour, to hear once more the lines you were reciting? Once more? repeated Celestina. Have you heard them once already, then? I will say I have not, if my acknowledging that I have will displease you. I do not think, said Celestina carelessly, that will mend your case much, but, however, the lines were not worth your hearing, and everything you even repeat from another, cried he, eagerly interrupting her, is worth hearing. How much more worth hearing when that fascinating voice is employed in expressing the sentiments of that elegant and lovely mind. Oh, Celestina! But forgive me, madam, it is presumption indeed in me to address you so freely. Yet Celestina is the only name in the world that seems to me fit for you. The common terms of formal civility are unworthy of you. Let me then call you Celestina, not in familiarity, but in veneration, in adoration, and entreat you, implore you to oblige me. Disconcerted at his vehemence of manner and extravagance of expression, Celestina now thought it better to put an end to such very warm applications by showing him the little value in her eyes of the favour he solicited. She gave him the paper, therefore, saying coldly, You are anxious for a very trifling matter, and as you have already heard the lines, it is hardly worth the time you must give, hastily written as they are, and with interlineations and erasures, to make them out. "'Give me then time to do it,' cried he, as he kissed the paper and put it in his bosom. Celestina, more disconcerted by his manner than before, said yet more gravely, "'I beg I may have them again immediately.' "'You shall indeed,' replied Thorold, "'but I must first read them.' "'Read them then now,' replied she. "'It is impossible!' cried he, for here is Arabella and my brother coming to meet us, and it is the first time that being with you I felt their interruption as a favour. During this dialogue Celestina had walked rather quickly towards the house, so that they were by this time within sight of the garden gate, from whence Captain and Miss Thorold advanced slowly towards them. Montague, as if conscious of the impropriety of what had passed, now affected to be talking of indifferent matters. And Celestina, ruffled by his wild enthusiasm, and eagerly anticipating the letter which she hoped that day would bring her from Willoughby, felt herself made uneasy by the steady and inquiring eyes of the captain, who had required a very rude habit of staring people out of countenance. She was compelled, however, to endure it, not only while breakfast lasted, but afterwards, when Arabella engaged her assistance in painting a trimming, which was to compose the ornament of a gala dress for the balls at Tunbridge, whither she was going in June, with the eldest of her married sisters, who was in an ill state of health. End of chapter 4 Volume 2, Chapter 5 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 2, Chapter 5. Arabella Thorold desirous of availing herself of the superior taste and skill 
that Celestina possessed in such ornamental matter as she was now busy about, the merit of which she knew she might, where she was going, take entirely to herself, now invited her guest to the work-table at which she was employed. Montague took up a book to read to them aloud, while his brother sauntered idly about the room, now praising Celestina's performance, now correcting that of his sister, then humming a tune, looking at his watch, or throwing about the colours or the pencils. He seemed determined to interrupt his brother's reading, and particularly when by Montague's voice and gesture he saw that he hoped particularly to interest and attract the attention of his auditors. This scene, of which the painful anxiety of Celestina for her letter made her unusually impatient, was at length put an end to by the entrance of the servant from the post, and Celestina receiving, in trembling agitation, a letter with the Dover postmark. She flew with it to her own room, and read as follows. Dover, April 11, 17, blank. The vessel which is to carry me from England and Celestina is now waiting for me, and I have delayed writing to her till this last moment, not because I have ever ceased to think of her with the warmest solicitude, but because I have not till now been able to collect courage to bid her a long adieu. I am going, Celestina, to the south of Europe. Perhaps my stay may be very short. Perhaps I may, for the rest of my life, be doomed to be a solitary wanderer. But however destiny may dispose of me, let me entreat you, by all that regard which once made the happiness of my life, to take care of your health, try to regain your cheerfulness, and believe me, Celestina, strangely against me as appearances are, I have not deserved to lose your confidence, nor have I any wish so fervent as for your happiness. I cannot write to you on pecuniary affairs. Cathcart has, in regard to everything of that sort, my full directions. Whenever he and Jessie become housekeepers for themselves, you will be their welcome guest, and my heavy heart will be relieved of much of its anguish. Till then, I entrust you to the care and direction of the excellent friend you are now with. May it not long be necessary for me to... But I dare not trust myself on this subject. Write to me, for now the measure I have been driven to is adopted. I can hear from you without fearing that my resolution may be shaken. Heaven bless and protect you, dearest Celestina. This is the first wish I form when, after my uneasy slumber, recollection returns in the morning, and the last before I attempt to sleep at night. Alas, it is often only an attempt. But there is no end of this. Farewell, most beloved Celestina. Farewell. G. W. This letter was, if possible, more unsatisfactory than the last. No reason was yet given for his having left her, no certainty held out of his return. But all, if not hopeless, was so comfortless, so obscure, that her resolution to investigate the cause of all that had happened again failed. She feared even to attempt putting aside the fearful veil that was drawn between them. He was now in another country, from whence his return seemed uncertain, and she seemed the most desolate and forlorn being that existed on that which he had left. Her heart sunk within her in remembering that she might never see him more, that he hardly seemed to wish she should. Again she read his letter over. He was sleepless, restless, unhappy, and for his sufferings she wept more than for her own. The plan he mentioned of her residing with the Cathcarts was the only one to which, since their separation, she had looked forward with any degree of satisfaction, 
but that there was yet little probability of executing for old winnington was in even better health than he had been for some years and though the tender assiduity of jessie had won much even on his insensible heart he suffered her to have no authority and often being seized with fits of jealousy and suspicion that she went to meet and assist her father he would insist upon her not quitting him a moment so that she had sometimes for many days together no opportunity of seeing her husband and had never once since her separation from celestina been able to reach her present abode celestina had not been an hour alone before montague thorold tapped at her door she dried her eyes and pulling her hat over them opened it to him will you not walk said he apologizing however for his intrusion i am afraid i disturb you but the morning is so beautiful and we are all going to see a pond fished with two friends of my brothers from exeter who are just come in i cannot indeed answered celestina pray excuse me i would not press you for the world said he to do anything that is disagreeable to you but the air will be surely useful to you you have been weeping miss de mornay and if i have replied she interrupting him you may be assured sir that i have reason enough for my tears and would wish to enjoy them alone precious tears cried he with a deep sigh the letter was from the fortunate willoughby fortunate do you call him but celestina as if offended that any tongue but hers should name him stopped and turning from the door went into her own room at this moment arabella ran upstairs to fetch her cloak and gloves and seeing her brother montague at the door of celestina's room cried as she passed him hey day are you in waiting as page or gentleman usher as neither answered he in some confusion i was merely asking if miss de mornay would walk with us oh i dare say not replied his sister smiling maliciously as she looked over her shoulder at him i dare say not montague what are you in now are you romeo oh that i were a glove upon that hand that i might touch that cheek or are you castalio sweets planted by the hand of heaven grow here you always make love i know by book what shall i call edmund to take the part of polydor i think you will make it out among you celestina who had heard this speech though it was not meant that she should was equally amazed and hurt at it it had however a very different effect from what the speaker intended who having no wish that celestina should join them because she desired to monopolize the conversation of the two strangers thought by rallying her brother to break off his entreaty montague mild as he was was piqued extremely and would resentingly have answered if his sister had not immediately disappeared and if celestina had not at the same moment opened her door and said you compel me mr montague to walk whether i will or no pray forgive me said he interrupting her i would purchase no pleasure at your expense arabella now returning downstairs was surprised to see her preparing to go i thought you declined walking ma'am said she formally celestina made an effort to conquer the resentment she justly felt and replied coldly that the morning was so pleasant she thought it would be a pity to lose it her apprehensions indeed were that had she remained at home montague who had persecuted her the whole day would have remained also and the hint his sister had given of the rivalry of the brothers had at once shocked and amazed her after a moment however she began to fancy that her speech had more malice than meaning in it but the uneasiness of her situation and the necessity of soon removing from it recurred to her more forcibly than ever she endeavoured as she went downstairs 
to regain her composure, apprehensive that the strangers, if not the family, might remark her emotion. But she soon found that there was little to be apprehended from either the one or the other. Captain Thorold was walking arm in arm before the house with Captain Musgrave, the elder of the two gentlemen, and Miss Thorold wholly monopolised the attention of Mr. Bettinson, a very young man, heir to a considerable fortune, who had a few months before, on his leaving Eton, purchased a cornetcy of horse, very much against the inclinations of his father, whose only son he was. He could indeed give no other reason for his preference to a military life, but that he supposed it to be a very idle life, and that he should look uncommonly well in the uniform of the corps. This, however, did not succeed to his wishes, though he was very far from being aware how entirely they had failed. He had a very round back, very narrow shoulders, a long forlorn face, to which the feathered helmet gave neither grace nor spirit, and the defects of his mean and ill-formed figure were rendered more apparent by that dress, which is an advantage to a well-made and graceful man. He had twice danced with Bell Thorold at the provincial assemblies towards the end of winter, and now, after having been in town for a few weeks, prevailed on Captain Musgrave to introduce him to a family, where he supposed he might find a monstrous good lounge for the rest of the time he was to be quartered in the neighbourhood. Celestina no sooner saw Miss Thorold's behaviour to this young man than she accounted at once for the dissatisfaction she had shown at her joining the party, for she endeavoured by more than her usual vivacity to monopolise all his attention. She watched with uneasy curiosity every glance of his eye towards Celestina, and seeing that he hardly noticed her being among them, and was not struck with that beauty which the captain and Montague had so admired, she presently resumed her usual confidence in her own attractions, and thought only of securing the advantage she had gained. Celestina, not having the remotest wish to interfere with her conquests, and being displeased and offended at the curious looks and whispers of the two other military men, who continued to saunter on before, was again under the necessity of listening to Montague, who had never failed seizing every opportunity obliquely to hint to her the increasing admiration with which she had inspired him, though he at the same time gave her to understand that he knew he had nothing to expect but her pity and her friendship. This was, however, repeated till it became very uneasy to her, and the more so, because so respectful was his address, that she seldom knew how to show resentment, and so sincere appeared his repentance, when she expressed any, that she could not long retain it. As they now followed the rest of the party, Celestina took occasion to ask Montague for the paper she had been teased out of in the morning. "'I know not,' said she, on his evasive answer, "'whether my folly in giving it, or your absurdity in keeping it, be the greater. Pray restore it, and let us think no more of such trifling. I will give you,' answered he, "'a copy of it, which I have already began to write. But for the original—' He stopped, and suddenly seizing her hand, pressed it to his breast, where, under his waistcoat, the paper was enfolded. "'There,' said he, "'there is your paper. I have put it next to my heart, and never shall it be displaced, unless you will give me some yet dearer memorial to remain there.' Celestina withdrew her hand in confusion, and feeling more than ever the necessity of putting an end to such sort of conduct, she said, with evident displeasure and concern, "'You behave, Mr. Montague,' not only improperly in this foolish matter, but cruelly and insultingly towards me, who have, you know, at this time no proper home to receive me. But since you thus persecute me with conversation, 
from which, though I cannot escape, I can only hear with concern and resentment, I must as soon as possible find another temporary abode, and acknowledging all your father's kindness, quit his house. The young man, who, amidst his wild enthusiasm, wanted neither sense nor generosity, was now shocked at her supposing he meant to insult her, and terrified at the idea of her being driven to inconvenience by leaving his father's house. "'I am always offending,' said he, in a voice expressive of the concern he felt, "'and I am afraid often wrong. But pardon me once more, Mr. Mornay, pardon and pity me, and I will not again trespass on your patience with discourse which perhaps you ought not to hear.' though surely the happy Willoughby himself would not be alarmed at the hopeless admiration of a man who knows that he can never pretend to any other than distant and humble adoration. It were all one that I should love a bright particular star. He was going on when Captain Thorold, who had imperceptibly slackened his pace, caught these words, which were spoken in a theatrical tone, and stopping with his friend, Celestina and Montague were immediately close to them. So, Montague, said he, at the old game, Mr. Mornay, I bar all quotations. Tis not fair for Montague to avail himself at once of his own talents and those of all the poets and sonneteers he is acquainted with. He will avail himself of neither, sir, answered Celestina, and I assure you I wish our conversation to become more general. There, Montague, cried the captain, you see you have tired Mr. Mornay in your tete-a-tete. -tete. Let us see if Musgrave and I cannot more successfully entertain her. Celestina, who did not promise herself much advantage from the change, since Captain Thorold's address to her was often as warm as his brother's, but never so respectful, now hastened forward to join Miss Thorold. But she received no notice either from her or her little military bow. They were by this time, however, near the end of their walk, and were met by the family of Mr. Cranfield, to whom the pond belonged, which they were to see fished. The children, several fine boys, now at home for their Easter holidays, were assembled round it, eager and delighted. Montague, who was a great favourite in the neighbourhood, was engaged in talking with their mother and with them, while their father, having civilly noticed the whole party, entered into conversation with the gentleman, and Miss Thorold and Mr. Bettinson still continuing to entertain each other, regardless of everybody else. Celestina, who was fatigued by her walk, and still more by the uneasiness of her reflections, sat down under one of the trees which overshadowed the pond, and her thoughts, which had long been distracted by interruptions, were immediately with Willoughby. So entirely, indeed, was she for some moments absorbed in reflection, that though she saw objects moving before her, and heard the shouts of the boys, the mixed voices of the party who surrounded the water, and the servants who were drawing the nets, she totally forgot where she was, and was insensible even of that want of common politeness which the whole party evinced in so entirely neglecting her. Montague, however, could not long be guilty of it, but disengaging himself from Mrs. Cranfield, who was one of those incessant talkers from whom it is difficult to escape, he came towards her, and fearful of renewing the displeasure she had so forcibly expressed a quarter of an hour before, he only named his fears that she might receive injury by sitting on the grass, to which, as she gave a cold and reluctant answer, he added a deep sigh, and then, leaning against the tree under which she sat, he fell into a reverie as deep as her own. From this mournful silence, she was roused by the sudden appearance of a horseman, who rode very fast near her, and who, on lifting up her eyes, she immediately discovered to be Vavasour. 
a thousand painful sensations arose on the sight of him though the first idea that occurred was that he came from willoughby he passed her however without seeing her and reaching the party who were beyond her he gave his horse to his servant and joined them by the manner in which vavasour addressed mr cranfield and the manner in which he was received by him celestina immediately understood that he was an expected guest he comes not to me said she willoughby sends no friend to me he is far far off and perhaps his most intimate acquaintance may now shun as assiduously as he once sought me then the fear she had once entertained that some difference of opinion had occasioned a quarrel between him and willoughby recurred to her and remembering how different her situation had been when he abruptly left alverston and how very cruel was the change she grew distressed at the thoughts of meeting vavasour and meeting him before so many strangers she again repented having walked out and her soul sickened at the many uncomfortable occurrences to which she was continually exposed in a few moments vavasour who seemed to have lost none of his vivacity had been introduced to the captain and miss thorold but he hardly made his bow to them before he said to the latter mr mornay is with you still madam is she not with us replied arabella oh yes mr mornay is with us she is well i hope inquired vavasour eagerly you may satisfy yourself by personal inquiry said mrs cranfield for there is the young lady she and mr montague really form a very picturesque appearance vavasour now turning his eyes on the opposite side saw celestina and instantly advanced towards her with an eagerness of manner which he took no pains to check she arose on his approach and hardly knowing how to receive him so various and painful were her sensations she held out her hand to him then withdrew it and when he spoke to her with all that good humour with which he used to approach her in her happier days it brought those days back to her mind so forcibly that she could not conquer her emotion and burst into tears vavasour was immediately checked and said with evident concern my dear mr mornay the pleasure i felt in again seeing you conquered for a moment the recollection of what has happened since we parted last it is a subject said celestina trying to recover herself on which i cannot now talk yet and she moved a few steps forward to escape the earnest looks of montague thorold which were fixed on her face yet i cannot help asking if you have seen your friend since vavasour walking on with her to avoid the observation of the company said seen him to be sure i have i was continually with him in london all the while he remained there celestina now proceeded in silence struck with the idea that willoughby had certainly acquainted his friend during that time with the reason of their abrupt separation she had not however courage to ask him but having wiped away the tears which a moment before filled her eyes she turned them upon him with a look so expressive of what passed in her heart that vavasour who could not misunderstand her answered as if she had spoken to him i do not certainly know the cause of george's very sudden and extraordinary change of measures but i have reason to believe the castle norths though how i cannot tell were the occasion of it though i was with him every day i had very little conversation with him for he always affected to be or really was hurried if i saw him in the course of the day or if towards night complaining of fatigue and taking laudanum without which he said he could not sleep when he informed me of his having left you at alverston without accounting for his absence he saw my astonishment and put an end at once to my inquiries by saying vavasour you know my unbounded confidence in you and that anything that related merely to myself would be known to you as the first friend of my heart 
but do not ask me any questions now. I cannot answer them truly, and therefore I will not be liable to them. Even your friendship and zeal can here do me no good. This, continued Vavasor, precluded all inquiry, nor could I obtain any farther satisfaction when a few days afterwards, the very day indeed before he left London, he desired I would meet him at the chambers of Edwards, our mutual attorney, where, in spite of my resistance, he paid me the money which you know I lent him, with the interest, with as much regularity as if I had fixed that time for payment. And when I very warmly remonstrated on the unfriendly appearance this had, besought him to oblige me by keeping the money, and expressed something like resentment at his conduct, he said, with a sort of affected calmness, and almost sternly, Vavasor, I am going abroad. I may die, and I will not leave anything between us to be settled by Lady Molyneux, who would be my heir at law. And do not you, added he, my good friend, get a habit of throwing your four or five thousands about you, but learn to value money a little more. And friends a little less, said I, interrupting him in my quick way, for that, Willoughby, is the next lesson I expect to hear from you. This money, however, Edward shall keep till you are quite sure you do not want it. I am already sure of it, said he, and do beg, my dear Vavasour, that you will immediately pay it into the hands of the person from whom you borrowed it for my use, as the only way in which it can now contribute to my satisfaction. Willoughby then left me with the attorney, of whom I inquired if he could guess where he got the money. Edwards assured me he could not, as he knew nothing more of the affair than that he was that day to pay it at his chambers to me. This circumstance seemed, in the mind of Celestina, to confirm the notion Vavasour had started, that the Castle Norths were somehow or other the cause of Willoughby's having left her. Yet, as they could have no power over him from affection or friendship, their influence, if indeed they possessed any, must arise from their riches. And what was such a supposition but to suppose him a sudden convert to mercenary politics, from being generous and disinterested even to excess, if such noble qualities could ever lean towards error. The mind of Celestina no sooner harboured such an idea than her heart rejected it. But all she heard from Vavasour tended only to augment her perplexity and her sorrow, which, as he perfectly understood, she saw that he would, if he could, have removed. Almost afraid of asking any question, where it was easy to see he could not answer without wounding her, she acquired, after a few moments, resolution to say, "'Where, sir, did you at last part from him? What did he then say to you? I took leave of him at the hotel where he lodged, and where I had been with him for about an hour before the chaise came to the door. He was sometimes very grave, and even dejected for a few moments.' then tried by hurry and bustle to drive away his dejection. I asked him why he went to the south of France, where he had been before, rather than to Spain and Sicily, which he had often expressed an inclination to see. He answered that he had business in France. But it is more than probable, continued he, that I may see Spain and Sicily, or Turkey for aught I know, before I return to England. "'And did he?' inquired Celestina mournfully. "'Did he say nothing of me? "'Did he not even mention me?' "'Very often,' replied Vavasour, "'for indeed I forced him into the conversation.' "'Did there need force, then?' said Celestina in a plaintive tone, "'and ready to melt into tears. "'Yes,' answered Vavasour, "'for though I believe he thought of nothing so much,' He seemed frequently unwilling to trust his voice with your name, and sometimes, after we had been speaking of you, he sunk into a gloomy reverie, and reluctantly spoke at all. 
one great object of his solicitude was your future residence he seemed however very easy while you were under mr thorold's protection tell me are you yourself happy in his family happy said celestina can i be happy anywhere perhaps not just now but you know what i mean when i use the common term happy are you satisfied with your residence do you mean to continue there i hardly know sighed celestina what i mean so heavy so unexpected was the blow that fell upon me that my stunned senses have not yet recovered it and for happiness i am afraid it never can be mine well my sweet friend though i hope and believe otherwise we will not talk now either of our hopes or fears but are the family you are with pleasant people of whom do they consist of mr thorold to whose worth you have heard willoughby do justice of his wife his daughter and at present of two sons yes i see the captain is among you you know him then a little some friends of mine are acquainted with him he is a man of great gallantry i have heard and affects the very first world does he not really i hardly know yes i believe he may be that sort of man celebrated i think for having sent more young women broken-hearted to bristol than either charles cavendish or ned harvey that is the sort of praise that attracts your hearts while we rattle-headed fellows who are very honest though not very refined who say no more than we mean and address you not as goddesses only to laugh at you for believing us but as mere mortal women are called rakes and libertines and i know not what as if twenty such careless i had almost said harmless lads as we are do half as much mischief as one of those plausible sentimental sighing sycophants who mean nothing but the gratification of their own paltry vanity bless me mr vavasour cried celestina won a moment from her own anguish by this odd remark you seem as much discomposed as if the redoubtable captain had sent some favourite of your own to bristol no upon my soul my favourites i speak pretty plainly you know my acquaintance have in every instance but one lain among people not easily sent to bristol come now don't affect prudery i tell you though celestina that had such a fellow sent a sister of mine to recover health ruined by the disappointment of expectations he had raised i believe i should try if i could to stop his career it is fortunate then perhaps for the captain that you have no sister i may however have friends added he earnestly fixing his eye on the face of celestina i may have friends for whom i may be as much interested as i could be for the nearest relation and them i would put upon their guard i would very fain misunderstand you said celestina because i think you ought to know that situated as i am i need no such precaution or oh, you must have a mean opinion of me indeed if knowing mr willoughby you can suppose that she who has once been attached to him can throw away a thought upon captain thorold ay that's true all very true and very fine but look ye my dear celestina i've no way of judging of others but from myself and though to be sure i don't speak from experience in these honourable sentimental sort of treaties i am confoundedly afraid that had i been engaged to helen and found that by some cursed counterstroke of fortune her divinity ship was not to be had that after a little raving and swearing and scampering about the world to get her out of my head i should have fallen in love with with andromache said celestina helping him to a comparison and smiling oh no answered he she was too wise and too melancholy for me your weeping and tragical beauties would make me cry but never could make me love faith i think briseis or chryseis would have been more to my taste or cressida perhaps 
oh she would have suited me exactly well sir said celestina resuming her gravity you undoubtedly follow the golden rule in judging of others but give me leave to assure you that in the present instance it would mislead you and that you are the only man in the world from whom i could listen to such a supposition without resentment you however do not i know mean to hurt me no that i don't by heaven cried he kissing her hand and so do now tell me how and when i can see you again i cannot tell since it probably depends on your stay in this country that depends then upon you upon me yes upon you for i came down with no other intention in the world than to inquire after and see you and for that purpose only have consented to undergo the company of cranfield and his wife very good sort of people indeed but confounded bores who have invited me down these two years and whose invitation nothing but their being within four miles of thorolds would have made me accept celestina was at a loss what answer to make to this because she did not know whether he meant to impute his solicitude to the care he took of willoughby's interest or simply to his friendship for her for of any warmer interest than friendship she had not the remotest idea she had however no time to answer for montague thorold who had followed them with his eyes ever since they parted from the rest of the company now came hastily on towards them to say his sister was returning home celestina rejoined them immediately and after mr and mrs cranfield and their guest had been invited and consented to dine with the thorold family the next day they separated vavasour betraying a violent inclination to attend celestina home and seeming to repress it with great difficulty from the habit he was in of doing whatever pleased himself without considering whether what he did was according to the established forms of the world rude or polite he felt however that to quit his hospitable friends on the moment of his arrival would be carrying his carelessness a little too far and therefore after lingering as long as he could he reluctantly left her to montague thorold who had walked silently by her for some moments and wished her a good day End of chapter five Volume two, chapter six of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume two, chapter six. Celestina in whose mind a thousand painful thoughts had been revived by this interview, was too much lost in them to attend to Montague Thorold, who, still in silent dejection, walked by her, while his brother was engaged with Arabella and his military friends. Montague had narrowly watched her the whole time she had been conversing with Vavasour, and though hopeless himself, could not see her receive another with such an appearance of interest as he had remarked towards Vavasour, without mortification. "'Mr. Vavasour,' said he at last, "'for that, I think, is the gentleman's name. "'Mr. Vavasour is an old acquaintance of yours?' "'A very particular friend of Mr. Willoughby's,' replied she, "'and, of course, a friend of mine. "'A single man, I suppose?' "'I believe so,' said Celestina. At least I never heard he was married, and you see he has not a very sober married look. No, really, very much otherwise. But he does not seem to have communicated any portion of his gaiety to you. I am not indeed greatly disposed to be gay, said Celestina, and since I am not merry, would it not be as well to be wise? Do, Mr. Montague, give me that silly paper its detention is useless to you and disagreeable to me 
pardon me then if for once i am guilty of what offends you i cannot part with it but it is my first and shall be my last offence i hope so said celestina very gravely the thing is in itself of no consequence and i wonder you should be so childishly anxious to keep it your hands have touched it your letters are upon it you composed the lines well sir cried she impatiently and willing to put an end to a speech to which she feared the captain might listen since you will not give it me or destroy it the only favour i have to ask is that you will never speak of it again either to me or any other person a needless precaution exclaimed he a very needless precaution is the latter and alas in the former i cannot trespass long for in a few days a very few days i return to oxford and i shall then be no more liable to excite your displeasure you will cease to recollect that such a being exists no indeed said celestina whoever is dear to mr thorold to your father to whom i am so much obliged must have a claim to my recollection and my good wishes oh how cold does that sound from those lips said he and how little those expressive eyes are calculated to talk of mere good wishes they are so enchanting when they say more when they look as they did just now on mr vavasour how i envied him the simple god bless you and adieu mr vavasour and the look that accompanied them ridiculous cried celestina really mr montague the style to which you have accustomed yourself destroys all conversation if however that adieu was so enviable i will bid you farewell with quite as much sincerity god bless you and adieu mr montague they were now very near home and celestina hastening forward crossed the garden by a nearer way and reached her own room she there began once more to meditate on her situation every day that she had passed at mr thorold's house had increased her desire to leave it and she now more than ever regretted that she knew not whither to go her concern was increased by a note brought to her from the neighbouring village from whence she had early that morning sent to her former abode at thorpe heap to inquire whether if she had occasion for them she could again have her former lodgings the answer imported that the old man and his wife had died within a few days of each other the week before and that the house now belonged to one of the sons who had a large family of his own and intended to remove into it himself as being more convenient than his former habitation this forlorn hope being entirely over her reflections on her situation became more painful since she now knew not one place in the world where she could with propriety go she had once or twice consulted cathcart on the subject who not being aware of the circumstances which rendered her present abode uneasy to her and knowing how much willoughby desired her to continue there rather discouraged than promoted any scheme for her removal flattering himself that the time was not far distant when her presence would give in the opinion of jesse and his own a charm to the house they hoped to call their own celestina was well aware of his reasons for wishing her to remain where she was and did not love to explain hers for desiring to remove lest she should appear at once fastidious and vain she could not relate to cathcart what after all might be fancy that mrs thorold did not love her though she was civil to her that miss thorold beheld her sometimes with dislike and never with friendship and that of the two brothers the elder often affected to entertain her with conversation such as though she could not directly complain of it she could not hear without being offended and mortified while the younger never ceased pursuing her with declarations of romantic attachment less disgusting but equally if not more improper for her to listen to in mr thorold she had always a steady friend 
and a disinterested adviser but to him she could not state the reasons that made his house uncomfortable and his kindness useless nor complain that his wife and daughter slighted or his sons made love to her and though he possessed a very uncommon share of discernment he seemed determined not to perceive either himself on no plan of removal however could she at present determine and had fixed on nothing but to find an opportunity to hint her discontent to Vavasour when she was called down to dinner. The two military strangers were gone, but Celestina found they were engaged to dine there the next day with the Cranfield family and Mr. Vavasour, and Mrs. Thorold, who piqued herself above all other things on giving as good entertainments as some of her neighbours who kept men cooks, was so impatient to prepare for the dinner of the next day that she would hardly give herself time to eat that of the present but hurried away to her storeroom the instant the cloth was removed arabella had yet a more important concern to attend to mr bettinson had been so lavish of his compliments which were indeed the only sort of conversation he was at all perfect in that she had no doubt of having made if not an absolute conquest, at least such an impression on his heart as another interview would make indelible, and though his extravagant praises and the heavy language of two rolling black eyes, which in lustre and shape Montague compared to two pickled walnuts, had not so far blinded the judgment of Arabella, but that she saw he was extremely weak, she considered his great fortune, and that if he could not lead, he would probably submit to be driven, for which she thought she had all possible talents, and was sure she had all possible inclination. He had not a title, indeed, but was the third or fourth cousin of a man that had. Of course he was a man of family himself, and had he not been so, had his birth been mean, and his person less tolerable, his fortune would not have suffered her a moment to consider either as of any consequence. But though she entertained a very great inclination, and a very well-grounded hope to secure Bettinson, she had not the least objection to make an experiment at the same time on Vavasour, who had a still better fortune, with a very handsome figure, and who she had heard described as one of those agreeable rakes, who are blamed and loved by all their acquaintance she had heard too that he declared himself not to be a marrying man the greater therefore would be her glory should she happen to charm him into other sentiments and when she looked in the glass she thought nothing more probable as to celestina besides her engagements with willoughby she considered her as quite out of the question neither captain musgrave nor bettinson had taken any notice of her and the latter had declared he thought her far from handsome Arabella therefore saw nothing to impede her success, and even fancied that as she intended to be infinitely lively and entertaining, the melancholy air and pensive face of Celestina would produce a contrast extremely to her advantage. While her mother therefore was busy with her jelly and custards, Arabella was preparing her artillery against the hearts of her expected guests, and Celestina, who dared not venture out lest she should meet Montague Thorold, who had placed himself where she could not escape him, remained the whole evening alone in her own room, where she formed a sketch of the letter she intended to write to Willoughby. This employment, by fixing her thoughts entirely on the object which broke in upon every other that at any time of necessity engaged them, quieted and soothed her spirits, she forgot everything but her wish to convince him of her unfailing attachment, and to pour out before him a heart that was entirely his own. She determined, however, not to finish her letter till after she had talked to Vavasour, and then recollected that she could not tell Willoughby the result of that conference, without assigning her reasons for desiring to quit a protection where he had himself directed her to remain. This was an irksome task to her, for if he should happen to think her objections frivolous, he would be displeased that for those she removed, and if he thought them just, the idea of rivalry 
would add to the uneasiness which she knew her unsettled situation would occasion to him thus undetermined she could rest on nothing but the hope that vavasor might from his dislike to one or other of the thorolds for he was too frequently extremely fastidious and disliked with all his heart agree with her in the necessity there was for her change of abode without inquiring into all the reasons that made her desire it by the bustle she heard below in the housekeeper's room which was under part of hers and by the frequent running up and down of arabella's maid and the universal hurry of the household except mr thorold who on these occasions retired to his study for the evening celestina found she should rather accommodate than offend if she declined supping below she sent down a note therefore saying she was much fatigued with her morning's walk and begged to be excused for the evening and received a verbal answer that mrs thorold desired she would do as was most agreeable to her montague however who despairing of her coming out to walk had at last sauntered away alone no sooner found on his return that he was not to see her at supper than he went up himself and tapping softly at the door inquired if she was not well oh perfectly well said she but tired by my walk of this morning and not disposed to eat any supper surely cried he if you are tired you will need something you did not drink tea and yet will have no supper let me get something for you celestina declined this however as politely as she could but montague was not to be repulsed so easily he went down therefore and returning in a few minutes besought her to open the door and take some of the wine and water he had brought her distressed by civility which it seemed so rude to refuse and so painful to accept she hesitated a moment and then opened the door when taking one of the glasses she thanked him and would have wished him good night but he looked earnestly in her face ah said he tears you have been weeping again always in tears you have been writing too writing to the fortunate willoughby pray don't tease me so cried celestina if i have cause for tears you should remember that the greatest kindness you can do me is permitting me to indulge them and it signifies not who i write to it signifies no more indeed said montague with a deep-drawn sigh than as it excites my envy and my regret well well good night to you interrupted celestina pray don't let me keep you from supper oh said he putting his foot within the door so as to prevent her shutting it i have had my supper one look suffices me loose now and then a scattered smile and that i'll live upon ah you remember those delicious lines of that most elegant of our english poetesses it is to be all bathed in tears to live upon a smile for years to lie whole ages at a beauty's feet to kneel to languish to implore and still though she disdain adore it is to do all this and think thy suffering sweet shall i go on for the whole of that beautiful song is exactly descriptive of my feelings it is to hope though hope were lost though heaven and earth thy passion crossed but you are angry i am at least tired said celestina i must beg you would no longer detain me give me your hand then in token that we part in peace ma poi di pace in pegno la bella man mi die there sir said celestina coldly there is my hand and now good night oh that i dared seal my forgiveness upon it cried he eagerly pressing it but i dare not celestina withdrew her hand and again repeating a cold good night he at length permitted her to shut the door these frequent declarations which she could not affect to misunderstand greatly disturbed her and so well aware was she of the impropriety of suffering them 
that she was determined no consideration should induce her to remain another week if mr montague was not really returning within that time to oxford she had heard him repeatedly laughed at by his father his brother and his sister for his paroxysms of love if his present attention to her was only a return of the fit she felt herself degraded by being made the object of it and if it was more serious she thought herself to blame to suffer his assiduities on account of his father though she knew not very well how to put an end to them much less appearance of passion would have made many young women believe him ready to take the lover's leap or to apply laudanum or gunpowder as a remedy but celestina though not unconscious of her personal advantages had none of that overweening vanity which makes so many of inferior attractions fancy themselves irresistible nor any of that unfeeling coquetry which would be gratified by the despair of a man capable of real attachment she wished to put an end to montague's persecuting admiration both for his sake and her own and after some reflections concluded that it would be better to take an opportunity of speaking to him the next day and declaring to him that his extravagant behaviour would compel her to quit the house and lose the acquaintance of his family for she thought notwithstanding all his romantic flights he had so much good sense that he would see the impropriety and indeed the cruelty of his conduct if it were once fairly represented to him she now almost repented that she had not listened with more patience to the boasting egotism of the captain and had taken shelter from his equivocal compliments in the more agreeable because more literary conversation of montague and again she reflected with bitterness of heart that whether montague went or stayed his brother's character and indeed his manners towards her made her remaining where she was extremely improper yet that no eligible situation offered and for the first time since she had left lady molyneux she formed a half wish to be again with her though she knew she had there little kindness and no real friendship to expect end of chapter six volume two chapter seven of celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Jennifer Painter Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith Volume 2, Chapter 7 The preparations for a splendid dinner succeeded admirably, and Mrs. Thorold was in high good humour when her guests arrived. Arabella was still better pleased, for Bettinson, immediately on his entrance, had protested that she never looked so well in her life, and Musgrave whispered to her that, if she minded her hits she would be sure of the pretty boy for so he the cornet was termed by his captain intelligence so conveyed would have disgusted and offended a young woman of delicacy but bell thorold was too eager for conquest and too resolutely bent on securing a man of fortune to feel or to resent the freedom of this address from musgrave to whose praises of her she knew much of the attention of Bettinson was owing. Mr. and Mrs. Cranfield and Vavasour soon after arrived, and Celestina saw with surprise the pains Miss Thorold took at once to attract the notice of Vavasour, and increase the admiration of Bettinson. She had never before seen her in the company of young unmarried men of fortune, and now observed with concern how totally she defeated her own purpose she threw herself into numberless attitudes which she fancied becoming applied her hand incessantly to rectify a curl or adjust her necklace by which she thought to display its beauty as well as that of her hair and her throat which she had been taught to fancy eminently handsome she whispered about nothing laughed at some joke which nobody understood but herself and musgrave then affected to be angry at something he said to her, then talked to him by signs across the table, 
and by way of being charming was rude and childish but this sort of behaviour she had seen practised by some very fashionable young women it was perfectly adapted to the level of bettinson's capacity and she had not judgment enough to see that it must offend any man who had either good sense or good breeding vavasour who in the presence of celestina would have seen perfect beauty or extraordinary merit with indifference took no other notice of arabella than just served him to remark to celestina that she was one of the most conceited and pert girls he had ever seen this served as they walked after tea in the garden to introduce the discourse she wished to hold with him but it was extremely difficult to escape a moment from the vigilant assiduity of montague thorold pray said she to vavasour pray be more guarded her brother will hear you and that brother said he somewhat abruptly you seem very much afraid of offending though he seems to me to be a puppy how can you let him prate to you as he does indeed replied celestina you would not dislike him if you knew him and it is amazing to me that you who are really so good-humoured should take such dislikes to people before you can possibly know them and when i do know them i often dislike them more why now in this family who is there but the father that has any understanding and he has too much of the priest about him but here comes your high-flying oxonian surely it is hard not to have a moment with you though i want to talk to you about willoughby i will speak to mr montague said she and tell him so she then stepped back a few paces and meeting montague thorold who was approaching to join them she told him that mr vavasour had something to communicate to her on behalf of their mutual friend willoughby and that she should esteem herself obliged to him if he would prevent their being interrupted for a few moments montague with a melancholy and submissive look laid his hand on his heart and said one word from you is enough to him who lives but to obey you he then went back to the rest of the party casting a wistful look after celestina who turning into another walk with vavasour said eagerly well and now what have you to say to me from willoughby have you heard from him no replied vavasour i could not well do that since yesterday nor do i indeed expect it for some time to come but do you know mr mornay that i consider myself as willoughby's representative as a sort of guardian to you and am going in that character to talk to you very seriously well cried celestina conscious that her own conduct was irreproachable my sage guardian and reverend monitor begin then with your remonstrance or exhortation whichever it is to be you must give me leave to be serious on this occasion answered he most willingly replied celestina interrupting him and the more so because i never remember in all our former conversations to have had one serious discourse with you and i long to see how you acquit yourself i don't like the people you are with said he and wish you were anywhere else i wish i were anywhere else myself yet i like the family and believe them to be very good sort of people come come celestina you cannot be ignorant of what i mean captain thorold as i told you yesterday is that dangerous and hateful character a male coquette he never coquettes with me i assure you said she for i never give him an opportunity no because at present his brother has the advantage of him if you do not coquette with the military man at least you listen to the scholar and it may be he is the most dangerous of the two it is the general idea of the country that he is in love with you that the general idea of the country cried celestina how can the country possibly know anything about him or about me my dear friend interrupted vavasour you cannot be ignorant that in these places the people could not exist if their curiosity did not keep their idleness from total stagnation they will talk and let them about one another 
but I won't have them talk of you, who are of another order of beings. In short, I am jealous of you for my friend, and don't like to hear that Lord Castlenorth has paid off all Willoughby's encumbrances, and that he has procured him the reversion of his titles, to engage him to break off his connection with you, which it is said he formed before he came of age, and therefore thought himself obliged to fulfil. Celestina cried with great emotion. Dear sir, but how false and foolish is all this! It is so, resumed Vavasour, and what follows is equally or more so, yet it is, I find, generally believed. And what is it? Why, that Willoughby, having scruples about suddenly leaving you, and leaving you in comparative indigence, Lord Castlenorth has given you five thousand pounds, which, with what was before left you by Mrs. Willoughby, and the promise of a very considerable living in the gift of the Castlenorths to a clergyman if you marry one, have rendered you a desirable object in Mr. Thorold's eyes as a wife for his youngest son, whom finally you have accepted of, and are to be married to very soon, as Miss Fitzhaman has insisted upon this before she gives her hand to her cousin, which is also to happen very soon in Italy. "'Miss Fitzhaman,' said Celestina, turning pale, "'and pray, my good Vavasour, where have you learned this legend?' "'In London,' replied he, "'I collected enough to make me uneasy about your situation. "'I picked up more since I came down to Cranfield's, "'for his wife is a gossip of the first pretensions. "'And as to the Fitzhaman part of the story, "'their going abroad so soon after Willoughby has, "'I take it for granted, "'confirmed it in the opinion of everybody.' "'Are they gone abroad, then?' said Celestina. "'So say the newspapers, and I fancy rightly.' He then took one from his pocket, and read this paragraph. "'Dover, April 26, 17 blank. "'Yesterday Lord and Lady Castlenorth and their daughter, the Honourable Miss Fitzhaman, with a great retinue, sailed from hence on their way to the south of Europe.' Celestina was silent a moment, for not all her faith on the unchangeable affections of her lover could guard her from a momentary shock. Recovering herself, however, she said, They may be, and I suppose are gone, but certainly, certainly Mr. Willoughby had no share in their going. You surely do not think he had. As we know some part, great part of what you have heard, to be utterly false and unfounded, why may it not all be so? Certainly you do not believe any of it. Pardon me, answered Vavasour. I believe that this young man, this Montague Thorold, is what they call in love with you. For the rest, I know some of it is false, and I believe the greatest part of it is so. Gracious heaven, you have doubts then, Vavasour. Doubts whether Willoughby... "'But it is impossible you can doubt it. "'You know he is all honour, generosity, integrity, and goodness. "'I know I always thought so, "'or I should not have loved him better than any man breathing. "'But don't let me alarm you. "'I cannot doubt when I recollect all I ever knew of my friend. "'Yet I very honestly tell you "'that the mystery he made to me of his reasons for going abroad, "'the gloomy reveries in which I so often saw him, his evident struggles with himself, and a thousand odd circumstances which struck me when we were last together. Upon my soul, Celestina, I know not what to think, and should deceive you were I to tell you that I have no doubts. Yet they arise rather from my mistrust of human nature in general than my opinion of George as an individual. But when I look at you, and remember that he was within one day of calling you his, I cannot, upon any common principles, account for his conduct, and am sure that no common motives can justify it. Celestina, whose heart sunk within her while he could not deny the justice of this remark, sighed deeply, but remained silent. 
and vavasor went on be his motives however what they may it is certainly your determination to await the event of this mysterious journey it is certainly said she faintly well then is there not any more eligible situation for you than one where you are the subject of such reports as i have just repeated to you suppose if it be only for supposition's sake that they were to reach willoughby if he still loves you if repeated celestina good heaven you believe then that it admits of a question i did not mean to hurt you but my dear celestina there is nothing so insecure as our affections i am afraid and you must recollect too many instances of their change to suppose it quite impossible that well i will interrupt you no more if then if willoughby still loves me he will suffer extremely from such a report and should though i allow it to be very improbable should any changes have happened your apparent approbation of montague thorold will justify that caprice which nothing else can justify ah oh, vavasor said celestina in faltering accents i see i too evidently see that you believe your friend is lost to me for ever and that all you have now said is merely to prepare me for a blow which if it fell on me suddenly would you think destroy me but believe me vavasor believe me suspense such as i have long endured such as i at this moment endure is i think more insupportable than any certainty could be unless it were the certainty that willoughby is more miserable than i am that i think i could not bear but for the rest however i might suffer in my pride or in my love i trust that my mind would in time be reconciled to whatever is inevitable and perhaps continued she struggling with the violent emotion she felt perhaps that very pride might assist me to cure the anguish of disappointed and improperly indulged affection but yet it is surely impossible willoughby can have acted as these suspicions in regard to miss fitzhaman would make me imagine and still write as he writes to me however vavasor i again entreat you if you know more than i do to conceal nothing from me through misplaced and needless tenderness you know me very little answered vavasor or you would know how little concealment and dissimulation are in my nature my dear mr mornay i have faithfully related to you all i know of our friend and even my half-formed doubts i have not attempted to conceal from you be now equally ingenuous with me and tell me whether you think your present situation is either the most pleasant or the most eligible you could possibly choose it is not pleasant answered celestina because i am not mistress of my time but it is eligible surely because willoughby himself in some measure placed me in it and it is to his wishes i am to attend while he is yet interested about me and not to the vague and unfounded reports of people who care nothing whether i am happy or miserable so long as they have something to talk of but reflect a moment whether willoughby when he mentioned his desire of your continuing here was aware that captain thorold would therefore remain at home all the summer or that montague thorold would choose to make you the object of his romantic passion and the subject of his poetical panegyric you cannot but know that he does both and were you wilfully blind to it his behaviour to-day would have sufficiently convinced me celestina could not deny his extreme particularity in company and his private declarations were less equivocal without however acknowledging either to vavasor she said in general that for many reasons she should not be displeased to change her residence if she knew whither to go vavasor then began to lament that he had no mother no sister of whose friendly reception of her he could be assured but added he my dear mr mornay give me a day or two and some proper place will perhaps occur to me 
or rather to an excellent female friend whom i will apply to in the meantime i will see cathcart as i propose to ride over to alverston to-morrow and we will talk the business over together he then took her hand and in a manner more tender and less lively than was usual with him asked her if she would pardon him for anything he might have said to give her pain celestina assured him she could not forgive because she had never been offended but that she must ever be greatly obliged to him for the friendly part he had taken and then fearing that some invidious remarks might be made by the company they had left if they were any longer absent she desired vavasour to rejoin them while she went for a few moments to her own room to recover from the still apparent emotion which she had been thrown into from what had passed she had hardly however time to breathe before she saw montague thorold walking anxiously on the lawn before her windows looking towards them as if he knew she was returned to her apartment and almost immediately afterwards mr cranfield's carriage drove up to the door to take them home celestina now therefore composing herself as well as she was able hastened down to the company who except montague and vavasour were hardly conscious of her rejoining them mr cranfield being busied in giving to the elder mr thorold a long detail of a cause that had been lately decided at the sessions in which he had a principal share mrs thorold and mrs cranfield engaged in settling the affairs of the neighbourhood and comparing notes on the frequency of mr langley the curate's visits to mrs poole the widow of a rich farmer a matter in which these good ladies were mightily interested while miss thorold was violently flirting with bettinson and the other two military men walking together were talking over their former adventures and musgrave laughing at captain thorold for being thrown out as he termed it by his brother with celestina what the devil said he do you bury yourself alive in this manner for if montague is to supplant you faith my dear edmund tis so much against the honour of us all that if you don't make more progress i shall try what i can do myself don't you see that her attachment to willoughby is all stuff and that she throws out her lure for this vavasour if you like her what a cursed fool you must be to let her slip through your fingers as to liking replied captain thorold you don't suppose i intend to commit matrimony the girl is handsome and has more sense than most of them and therefore tis more worth a man's while to make a fool of her there i perfectly agree with you for though if i were condemned by any devilish mischance to marry i should dread nothing so much as one of your sensible women yet it is glorious to see how a little foolish flattery can set the sense of the shrewdest of them at naught but by the way edmund how did you get off with that business in ireland which for i had so much business upon my hands that i don't know what you mean why between you and miss o'brien was there not an impertinent brother or oh ay poor fanny o'brien twas the old story fanny was very pretty and faith i was very fond of being with them all for there were three others all sweet little dears their mother a good sort of widow was a little upon the qui vive when she heard i had a fortune and so forth and somehow or other i lived a good deal at the house and talked nonsense to the girls in my way you know till this miss fanny took it into her head to fancy herself in love with me and to suppose i had told her that i was so with her though if i did upon my soul twas only by implication i dangled to be sure and dined and danced with her but i meant nothing and was obliged at last to tell her mother so who very plainly signified to me one evening after i had passed the day with them that it was time to understand me well i gave her to understand then as civilly as i could though for faith they were a good sort of family that i had no thoughts of marrying and the good gentlewoman waxed wroth about it and told me i had done a very unhandsome thing in winning her daughter's affections i could only lament they were so easily won 
and return them undamaged by me. Something I said, however, gave Mrs. O'Brien offence, and she desired to see me no more, a prohibition which I, of course, did not attempt to disobey. And some other pretty girl falling in my way, faith, I thought no more of my poor Fanny, till being one night at an assembly at Dublin, I saw a great bustle soon after my entrance, and was told that Miss O'Brien had fainted away upon seeing me, and was gone home extremely ill. It was no fault of mine, you know, that the girl was so simply susceptible. But her brother, a fierce young sailor, who came a day or two afterwards from his ship, thought otherwise, and, talking to me rather cavalierly, we agreed that the matter must be settled in the Phoenix Park by a brace of pistols. Un beau jour, we accordingly met there, and exchanged each a couple of shot, with all possible politeness, in which it was my fortune to lodge a bullet in the flesh of his left arm, which was immediately extracted. I heard there was no danger, and as he was of course satisfied, I came off to England the next day, having taken my passage some time before. "'Your folks here at home never heard of the hazard you ran?' "'No, I believe not. My father is a little too apt to lecture and preach on such occasions, and so tis as well sunk, I believe. And since I've been in England, faith I've had no inclination to amuse myself in the same way, nor indeed any opportunity, except with this celestial beauty, and she don't seem to take to me.' "'The greater will be the glory,' replied Musgrave. "'I own I should like of all things, were I thee, "'to drive out a solemn, settled, sentimental affection "'from such a heart as hers, and jockey thy brother Montague.' "'Here the gentlemen were interrupted "'by the departure of Mr. and Mrs. Cranfield and Vavasour, "'after which Musgrave and Bettinson took leave themselves, "'having first received a general invitation "'from Mrs. Thorold and her daughter.' who, though by no means pleased to observe that Vavasour, entirely occupied Celestina, had beheld and heard her with frigid indifference, was yet much consoled by being almost certain that she had secured the heart of the little cornet. She judged very right. Musgrave, to whose care the father of Bettinson had recommended him, had purposely introduced him to Arabella Thorold, under the idea of detaching him from two milliners, to both of whom he had been making very serious love ever since his residence at Exeter. And the elder Mr. Bettinson was so desirous of saving him from a connection of that kind, which he was thus likely to form, that he no sooner heard of his growing partiality to Miss Thorold than he besought Captain Musgrave by every possible means to encourage it, declaring that fortune alone was no object to him, and that he should consider himself happy if his son was fixed in his choice of the daughter of so worthy and respectable a man as Mr. Thorold. End of chapter 7